Hello and welcome to the QA Therapy Podcast. Are you looking to improve your overall testing and quality practices? My name is Sergio Freire and I'm a solution architect and a testing advocate at X-Ray. And my name is Cristiano Cunha and I'm also a solution architect and test advocate. And we'll be your hosts and QA therapists throughout this series. In this podcast, we're going to tackle some of the most common testing and quality challenges that we all face in our teams. So if this sounds good to you, keep on listening. In this episode, we will talk about test automation. And this is a big topic with so many things to consider. We'll talk about test automation ownership, strategy, tooling, and many more. To assist us on this topic, we have a special guest with us. So please stay tuned. For starting, let's see what brings us here. What are the symptoms you are feeling that you may uh, need to address? So let me start by asking you some questions. Do you have difficulties in knowing what tests to automate and exactly how and where to start from? Do you feel there is an expectation that test automation will solve all of your problems? Do you see this idea flying around where test automation is seen as a mere replacement of existing test cases? Is test automation a mere synonymous of Selenium web-based tests? Or is test automation seen as a thing that is responsibility of some QA team or some dedicated test automation engineer? So what, what is the problem? All, all these are symptoms that appear when test automation is not yet fully embraced or fully understood by the team. Why do we need test automation? Do we need to have some strategy around it? Are there any tools that can do most of work uh, for us? Can we, we use test automation in different ways to deal with different kinds of risks? Does it change with the way we make, uh, we make software nowadays and that we will do in the future? Let's dive a bit into this topic. So it's time for diagnosis and prescription. And today we have here with us Toyer Mamji, our expert QA therapist to assist on diagnosis and prescription on these symptoms related to test automation. Toyer is a frequent speaker on testing conferences, and one of his favorite topics is test automation, among other topics. These topics are all intertwined, and they shape the way we do testing. We met at Agile Testing Days, and before COVID was really a thing, and I never forget his warm welcome there. Welcome, Toyer. Are you comfortable on our QA therapy couch? Definitely. Thanks so much, Sergio, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I do remember our meeting back in you know, Agile Testing Days, and I'm happy to be on your couch. So welcome once again. And just to start our discussion, so let's start perhaps with uh, test automation uh, ownership. Um, and this is somehow a, a recurring discussion. Who should own test automation? Do you think like a specific QA or test automation members uh, within the team, a dedicated team, developers? What has your experience shown uh, that works best? Okay, so I'm sure a lot of people will answer it depends on the company structure, right? So, so depending on the company size and, uh, you know, the structure of the engineering teams, uh, you know, there can be many different ways of actually you know, dealing with test automation. Obviously, you know, if you get smaller companies, potentially there's one person that does everything from develop from the development all the way to test automation. Uh, but ideally, what I've seen you know, over the over the years is that you know, if you have a good enough QA engineer in the team, the QA engineer usually drives the mindset around you know QA ownership, uh, the QA automation ownership, should I say, right? So. I mean, if you look at the different angles, for example, like having dedicated teams to do test automation, uh, there is probably reasons behind that. For example, you know, automation could start off quicker. Uh, you could uh, make a lot, much progress on, on automation. Uh, 
but obviously there's also some downsides around that, you know, in terms of that, how automation feeds back to the delivery lifecycle and how, how it's actually contributing to visibility and transparency into teams. It could then be seen as almost an isolated task that happens on the side without feeding back into the, the feedback loop, if you could put it that way, right? So, uh, and then if you look at uh, the other end of the spectrum where, you know, the developer takes the ownership of the, of the testing, that's also a, a good possibility uh, as long as there is sort of clear guidelines on, you know, what the d developer expectation would be around, uh, around the automation side there, right? So, uh, and then you get uh, probably the middle ground around, you know, the QA engineers uh, who's sort of, you know, the traditional exploratory manual tester uh, also getting involved in the, in the test automation. Uh, you know, my, my best sort of like uh, vision around how I see it and uh, uh, see it working is the QA engineer usually has that, you know, 360 view and uh, knows the different angles in terms of like testing coverage that's needed uh, and, and just basically having that, that view. Uh, so I think, you know, a QA engineer having the ability to do both, uh, you know, the testing, identifying the test plan and also coming up with test automation is usually uh, the one that can, like, is responsible in terms of driving it, but does not necessarily mean that uh, he or she would be the only person that actually, you know, uh, creates that scripts and run it, yeah? So, so it's about creating the mindset around automation, the visibility, and then passing it over to the team. Yeah. And more, more and more, uh, seeing more, let's say, this uh, more experienced people around QA, more as a, a co coaches that can, can that have a better understanding about let's the risks and, but not, but eventually not uh, as the ones that will actually implement the the tests themselves, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. So more as should... a, ad, advocates of quality peer, perhaps. Exactly. More, more of I would say an, an enabler and someone who Enable. uh, can yeah. push that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and we see we see a lot of conversations regarding automation, uh, and sometimes we see it. Um, a little bit like they call it the silver bullet. They will solve all of our problems and probably even replace testers because automation is all we'll, we'll have. What do you think about it? Do you think it's it's a, a truth behind this or it's exaggerated? Okay, I think it's... Uh, so I've had about 19 years plus in uh, test automation experience across many different industries right now. So I've seen, you know, all the different tools and, uh, you know, uh, sales people coming with magic solutions, you know. <laughs> uh, but in my view, you know, I think it's a misconception, to be honest. Uh, I think, you know, it's been sold as a, as a silver bullet. I think in different companies, potentially the, uh, the positive outcome of test automation varies. Uh, but uh, in my view, I see it as, you know, it's not a once-off activity and, you know, someone would come to sell it to you to say, you know, just implement this and it's done. You know, you, you, you have full confidence, you have full coverage in your systems and it's going to magically work. In reality, that's not how it works, right? We found that uh, through many years of experience that it's an ongoing task which needs a lot of maintenance, needs a lot of thinking behind how one tackles and approaches test, uh, test automation. So it's a it's a very critical art, uh, I would say, and, and something that uh, you have to understand your domain really well. The other aspect we see is sometimes, you know, uh, test consultancies or, you know, just experts coming in uh, from the outset. They might be really good at, you know, previous experience around, you know, implementing test automation uh, at companies, but how has it been maintained over the, over the years? You know, I think that's... That's something that you need to understand the architecture of the system that you're working in, in order to build a ideal test automation suite for that particular company and organization, right? So definitely I feel that it's sold as a silver bullet, but there's many things behind it. Um, and Tyre, what other misconceptions have you seen around test automation? Yeah, so I think uh, Cristiano touched on it around, you know, uh, possibly like replacing QA engineers uh, or just like simplifying the, the load of work. So that definitely, is, you know, it simplifies tasks. It supplements the whole QA and testing activity. 
I don't think it will ever replace QA engineers. I think that's a whole new controversial topic that uh, <laughs> you know we can for have sure. for another day. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the one uh, misconception. Uh, you know, the other misconception I I feel that. Uh, you know, you possibly don't need any other form of testing if you have uh, test automation. And uh, if you think about the depth of what needs to be covered nowadays, you know, whether that's non non-functional performance, security testing, accessibility, uh, you know, interoperability, and the works, you know, it gets it gets a bit complicated, right? So I think it's been sold as like one bucket, but potentially there's many things hiding underneath it. And uh, and those are some of the big misconceptions I've seen in the industry today. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things you told you you just talked about is also cost. So sometimes teams seeing it as too costly, and not only financially, but also uh, time investing or having a team to support it or things like that. So, do you think it's a costly thing, or do you think you have approaches where? It's an advantage yeah. to use. Yeah, I think uh, there's other misconception around, you know, the cost factor around uh, <laughs> test automation. And one one thing is probably because it's seen as almost a value add that supplements your normal development that happens, right? And it's it's seen as an additional thing that we can potentially, you know, uh, if we have it, you know, it'll be great. But if we don't, you know, we don't need to invest that the m- money in it, right? So I think. That's yeah. probably the reason why it's seen that it's seen as also separate tools that needs to be purchased over and above maybe you know the tool set that development or uh, you know agile has for example uh, so you know it's seen as a cost in terms of that and that's probably the reason why it's uh, it's seen that way the other factor is around you know the skill set that's needed to uh, to do this right it's not readily available uh, it's it's a niche market around test automation so Adding all of those factors in place, you know, it's then seen as, oh, it might be a huge uh, cost involved in, in this, right? So I think that's probably the reason why it's considered as a costly uh, part, but it shouldn't be because, you know, this is the value add that's going to add a massive difference to your end goal. And that's, you know, customer satisfaction and that's profitability and the works here. So let's let's shift our our conversation more to strategy and mm-hmm. in your perspective in your experience uh, what makes a good test automation strategy uh, that's, a, that's a it's a fully loaded uh, answer <laughs> i could i could say right so <laughs> i'll try to there's many different factors to keep in mind you know i think if i had to give very like summarize really quickly one the strategy that's most concise for me would be one that covers all levels of uh, of your application and the the levels that you would want to cover on test, on test automation based on that, right? So, so I think that could be that's one really important factor if I could if I could say. And then, uh, you know, breaking up your application if you you know whether you follow the test pyramid or you know any other sort of like model, like how are you covering uh, your automation within those levels? You know, once you define them. Uh, the other aspect around, I would say, is key is around, I've touched on this also, is the functional and non-functional aspects of testing, right? So, of, and I include this in the test automation buckets because I feel that there's test automation scripts that enable performance testing and security testing in a way. So I would try to make sure that I cover those. Uh, the other thing is that I, you know, I like to always approach any problem I have with the, you know, the five W's and the one H, right? So. Uh, what, how, who, uh, when, why, right? So, and then the how part of it also. So I like to look at, uh, like I mentioned, what uh, level should be covered, what are the tool sets that we're using and make sure that's like clearly defined along with the, the languages that we're using. You know, and sometimes it might not necessarily be the same language used for non-functional testing as an example. But just to be clear and, and make sure that your strategy covers exactly what you're using. Uh, you know, clarity on who does it, you know, the who part, you know, uh, we touched on this earlier also around, you know, the ownership, but there's also ownership, but there's also the, the execution and the creation of those scripts, you know, make sure that we cover who actually the, creates those tests and runs it. You know, the one other important part I see is on the, the how part. For example, you know, how do you do it? how it links back to the sprint regarding transparency uh, that's really important you know it's all it's 
I would say sometimes it's a missed factor where test automation is seen as a sideline activity. But how, but the biggest uh, value add for me is when it tied back to the sprint, right? So how can we show that relationship, uh, those type of things? And then even things like test data, where it's run, uh, you know, for example, is it run on cloud? Uh, those type of things, right? So I think those are the important factors to cover. Test data by itself is is really a big challenge. Yes, I would say. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so defining that test data around, you know, are you sourcing the data via APIs, via databases, or do you have, you know, a separate, uh, you know, location that you're pulling in the data from, or are you just, you know, generating it on the fly? Those type of things, you know. So I think it's really important. Like you said, test data can be a separate topic on its on itself. But it's really, really important on where you're gathering your test data from. Uh, which test environments you're executing your automation on is also key to keep in mind, right? So if you cover those angles, I think you should cover most of your test automation strategy. I, I, I would like just to highlight two aspects that you mentioned. I would say that all of them are, are relevant, but these two ones uh, came to my mind because for, uh, the first one is around Functional and functional and non-functional uh, testing, as yeah. some people frame it, because sometimes people just foco focus on uh, functional testing, on checking expectations uh, about uh, certain system behaviors. They forget about uh, performance testing yeah. or uh, other types of testing. Um, and uh, the other the other thing that you mentioned. And I'm just highlighting, of course, is the fact that this should be connected. This effort should be connected to the to the sprint because, in the end, if you have this as a separate project, then it will be disconnected from the sprint. the The sprint members will uh, have um, no close relation with the test automation effort that is being done. They don't see like the immediate value of it. So. It's really, for me, I think that it's really important to connect the effort that is being done on the test automation side and bring that value exactly to the sprint, to the context of the sprint. 100% agree with that. Yeah. yeah. For me, in my experience, all of that you guys say is true. But sometimes for me, it's about more thinking about what are, going, what are we going to test and how we're going to do. And sometimes this comes down to, well, we need to shorten those user stories to have shorter um, features or shorter amount of um, of things to test instead of just jumping into an automation tool and shipping automation uh, just um, blindly because sometimes we need to review the basics in order to. So all of those conversations and that collaboration that you just talked about, for me, are really important and Igniting this is really the, the important thing to start to have all team collaborating in automation. So talking about strategy, touching back on ownership, who do you think should be part of that discussion of the strategy? The whole team, QA, or what, what's your experience on that? I think, I think if you're looking at you know, uh, coming in with test automation you know, at the outset, let's just say you know, you're starting a project or... Uh, you know, at the maturity of where your product is, I think, uh, is really important. So, for example, if you're starting on a brand new project, you would want to take all of the team members uh, part of that journey. And, uh, you know, obviously having some experts, uh, potentially, once again, depending on the organization, whether you have other teams that have, you know, test QA engineers, test automation experts to come in as part of that discussion to give uh, their viewpoint around that. Uh, and then, you know, driving the discussion also from a system uh, development and architectural side of things so that everyone is aware on the effort involved in creating that strategy and what are the factors to consider uh, when you're actually building up that test automation strategy, right? So, so I think I would, I would go for the entire team uh, to be part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. And there might have been some, you know, precursor sort of like discussions had between you know, QA engineers, test automation experts potentially prior to that. So, uh, you know, they can get that discussions, initial discussions going. But like once the strategy is like finalized, I think the whole team needs to be part of that to, to really, really finalize that uh, test automation strategy. Yeah. And 
with software and let's say uh, with software evolving and we already have some years on our backlog yes, yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um well we all uh, i guess we all experienced monolithic apps and uh, uh, nowadays the the world is different and starting with let's say the is more monolithic apps. Uh, what are you, in your uh, experience the typical challenges yeah. whenever testing uh, those kind of systems? Okay, so I've had my fair share of uh, monolithic apps in the past, uh, <laughs> in trying to automate them. Uh, the first thing I would say, you know, is the limit, limited uh, tool set choices, right? That needs to be made when it comes to uh, like monolithic apps. So there's not a lot of uh, tools and some of the uh, monolithic apps, for example, where you know, testability becomes a problem around those, uh, those applications or systems, right? Because I don't think it was built with like modern architecture in mind. Uh, you know, access to source code could be limited uh, in those, uh, those type of systems. So, you know, the big factors for me is uh, limited uh, tool set choice, lack of testability, uh, you know, and then oftentimes, you know, if you if you start to dig in, like how modern uh, test or modern systems work is, you know, they usually fit into the build deploy sort of pipeline, and uh, you know, you can easily incorporate uh, your test automation into into that pipeline, right? So, so I think when it comes to something like uh, uh, the way monolithic systems are usually built and, and deployed, for example, uh, you find that the test automation tends to be siloed because it can, cannot be linked uh, easily to, to a pipeline, for example, right? So, so I think that's mm-hmm. also the, the disconnection between like, the, like an application and like test automation being an, an afterthought, uh, one after activity to, uh, to the deployment and the build of a, of a legacy or monolithic app, right? So, so I think there's many, many shortcomings around that, uh, that part, right? You could also look at, uh, you know, uh, potentially having slower running tests because, uh, because of uh, you know, maybe older tool set choice, for example, and you have many of those type of uh, problems that you would see in a, in a monolithic app. Yeah. Also connected to, to this, Toyer, um, what, uh, what would be the typical test automation approaches for, for this, to deal with this? Yeah, so, so I think you have to look at, uh, you know, I've seen uh, potentially because, you know, the exposure of like either the APIs or web services usually limited in like um, those type of apps. Uh, you tend to see a lot of the inverted uh, test automation pyramid uh, with this, right? Where you have a lot of uh, you know UI facing tests and uh, slower U- UI facing Selenium, tests. Selenium, right? Selenium, Selenium. Yes, and, then, and and even some of the commercial tools out there that used to exist yeah. in the past, right? So so I think it's a uh, it's driven a lot, uh, a lot like that, I think. And then if we spoke about it uh, to an extent was on the test data side of things, right? So, so usually that can also be a challenge on monolithic apps is, uh, you know, sourcing data from different systems, uh, for example, right? So, so I think then you have, you have that factor to keep in mind is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you factor for test uh, data? And putting inputting that into tests, so there's no real answer around that, but just things to watch out for when it comes to uh, monolithic apps is to is to think about uh, you know potentially how can how can you influence uh, the system that's already built in a way to to now try and and uh, foot in your test automation strategy, right? And try to as much as possible try to avoid you know the the inverted uh, code if you can uh, put it that way. Uh, so that you try and keep more up with like um, with faster running tests and getting faster feedback also around that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, we found the solution for monolithic apps, right? We disconstruct them into yeah. millions of microservices, and we we have a web of microservices. So, what changes in testing monolithic now versus um, microservices applications? Yeah, so I think, in I think view, that, of course. Yeah, most definitely. So, in, in my view, I think you know what changes is that you now have more of a detailed, broken uh, focus, so more component sort of focus, right? So instead of looking at the entire application in its entirety, I would say you're now looking at it in smaller chunks, which is a more manageable 
uh, in that in that level. It's a more more clear sort of like control over over your test automation because you can now break those pieces up into smaller chunks, automate that, and then have more sort of like control uh, going forward on the, on that automation, right? So. So I think that's the key thing that I see is that it brings a lot more control and a lot more focus uh, when we're doing microservices testing. Uh, and then you can sort of build on that by showing, you know, coverage also if you had to. Uh, and uh, and I think that's one thing that I see as a difference between monolithic and microservices. Yeah. Yeah, and then with this spread out of services and the need of connections, I see also the deployment being more hard than, than before because now we have this service that depends on the other service and the other service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now your test automation uh, strategy is not focused only in one because sometimes the flow of your application will go into different microservices. So what changes on your approach when you're changing, you're adapting your test automation strategy now with microservices. Yeah, so I think what, what changes is uh, definitely the clear ownership of uh, the microservices. So especially if you have dependent uh, microservices that you mentioned, you know, dependent microservices and services. So you can imagine, you know, potentially, especially if you're working in like multiple squads, multiple teams, for example, yeah. and if you have as much you can have like a million tests on your microservice, right? And if you're calling another microservice that has zero tests, like how can you have the confidence that you, you know, you end to end your services are going to work the way you do, right? So I think yeah, uh, there's sound. yeah, so there's clear coordination and communication needed in terms of like what is the expectation across all teams uh, that potentially develops or with, even within teams around you know, the microservices and like how you how you tend to uh, you know, need to have as much coverage from a testing and a test automation perspective around around those microservices right so i think that's you a, think you should elevate the strategy and instead of focus your test strategy in one team you should get yeah you should broaden get, it a little bit to ex, all of the teams to exactly, everyone to the, exactly yeah. especially if there's like dependencies on on those right so I think that's the that's the one factor. The other factor you would potentially look at uh, if you if you look at it in more of a of a narrower focus within teams or within you know, depends how you structure uh, build your microservices. For example, you know uh, the mocking side of things, right? So have a clear mocking oh, strategy yeah. around uh, you know uh, whether you have enough coverage uh, from from mocking out. So even if you you know. Keep in mind the bigger goal around, you know, cross teams and cross microservices, as an example, but also keep in mind the, you know, I'm owning this. What can I do to test as much as possible in this microservices, right? And if that means mocking yeah. out, have a clear mocking strategy. For example, you know, make your mocking strategy in such a way that if, if you were mocking, how can you simulate as much as possible the other microservices, as an example, right? So, so I think just you know, make clear the mocking strategy. Uh, you know, uh, once again, it also you know, considering like the the data that you're feeding into your into your test while you run it in the yeah. microservices uh, uh, test automation side of things. So, so those are key things to keep in mind uh, around that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You, Tyre, you mentioned tools, test automation tools, and uh, I remember that we've talked on the past uh, a bit around this. Uh, um, any special recommendations on the selection of uh, test automation tools? Yeah, so, to, to yeah so, so special recommendations will come in you know, regarding uh, the, the tool set, or I would say even the languages that you choose to use uh, in an organization across engineering, right? So uh, if you're choosing tools that are more closely related towards the developer uh, language set that's been used in the organization, uh, it brings us back to the first point that we spoke about uh, on the round test automation ownership, right? So the adoption by the rest of the team to to pick up, uh, to not be hesitant to pick up test automation is much more easier if you have a common language that, that everyone uses and understands, right? So so that's the first thing is like what language does uh, your tool uh, set that you that you consider uh, actually you know cover, right? So that's that's the first thing. The other thing is around, you know, going back to the levels that you want to cover. 
And uh, you know, do you have you know one tool set, for example, that covers UI, API, different levels? You know, I think that's that's important. Uh, if if the answer is uh, you know no, then you can go out and start considering you know multiple tools to meet the requirement of your of your multi-level approach, uh, right? So I think that's the that's the important things to keep in mind for me is around is around those uh, you know the platform support. Um, do you have support around you know mobile applications? Do you have uh, support uh, around you know what's your biggest you know browser selection, for example, you know by, by a customer base? Uh, does your automation tools that cover those, right? So, so I think it's a lot of that. Then you could look at supporting things like, for example, you know, open source uh, uh, community support, uh, those type of things around what you get on the, on the test automation tool side, right? Yeah, so I think those are some of the key factors to keep in mind. Yeah, and sometimes we see teams buying big, expensive tools that are there to do magic and solve all of your problems. And... I believe that, well, uh, in, in our conversation, we, we touched some of these this points, like if you don't have a clear strategy, if we don't have uh, the definition of what we want the tools to do. But I continue to see this. So how, why, 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 why in your opinion, do you think we still have people buying big expensive tools to try to do magic. Okay, so it's either the salespeople have gotten really good at it or, or the buzzwords have increased to a point where, you know, the buzzwords become this thing where if you're not doing it, you know, there's a problem, right? So we tend to see a lot of things like, you know, AI, machine learning type of things being oh, yeah. thrown in, into these sales and like test automation, I'm talking about the more modern sales, right? So blockchain. previously it used to be yeah, blockchain and everything, right? So so under the hood, like what is it really doing, right? And usually these sales pitches are done to people, uh, you know, outside of like being experts in test automation, you know, whether that be your C-level, uh, you know, uh, individuals or, or anyone else, you know, I think that's where, that's where these... Uh, you know, gets targeted at and then you know there's misconceptions around what it actually does and not knowing that really under the hood some of them you know potentially are just you know glorified like uh, test automation frameworks that just add a bit of features on it right so i think that could be that could be one factor the other the other factor is like you know not not knowing that there's still that we spoke about it also that there's still maintenance and ongoing you know hand holding that's needed on these tools right so that's another factor to keep in mind uh, around, around these magic tools. In and uh, looking a bit ahead with the with the ongoing evolution of sphere, uh, software, can you tell us, in your perspective, what are some challenges and opportunities for test automation with the, this ongoing re-evolution of software development? Yeah, yeah. Where do you see it going? Definitely, and definitely. all of those so, trends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, good questions, right? So I think uh, you know we've touched a little bit on the since like microservices is all the buzz nowadays. Like if you look at some of the challenges uh, we touched on these also is around you know lack of uh, ownership, for example, on individual microservices. Make sure that you know you solve that problem around you know uh, the ownership part of it. Uh, that's that's the one area around like opportunities. I see things around like, you know, fast changes and be able to adopt fast. So everything is about like quick reaction times, how quick can you deliver, how quick can you adopt, make sure your test automation strategies and approaches also mimic that type of, uh, of areas, right? So the other opportunities I would see, uh, you know, Sergio, is uh, things around like low code solutions that exist now in the market from a development perspective, like, um, you know, Asking also like the low code uh, people out there, uh, the enterprises that provide these software is why not have an all in one, you know, automation platform also while you're developing the low code, have something that can you know, automate these tests that you're developing as you go on, right? So all in one solution, I would say is something that uh, I would keep in mind. But, and then if you look at only from a, from a test automation provider perspective, what about, you know, having a tool that can do both functional, non-functional testing, uh, UI, API, everything, right? So provide a one-stop solution around meeting all of those requirements. That's an opportunity uh, I would see 
as something for the future that you know uh, can be adopted really fast. And then if you look at even going one step further from there is adding the traceability back to uh, to Agile in all in one solution, right? So having having your transparency from the way from the time you create your test cases or your scenarios all the way to automation and uh, functional non functional you have one space one space to find everything one tool set and and everything is built in for you right so i think that's an opportunity that i see that probably hasn't been taken in the industry just yet so it's something that i would, I would definitely see as an evolution of software and heading towards that direction yeah and investment on test automation is definitely something we need to do in different areas, in different levels, adapting to your needs. But sometimes we need something to convince our upper management that it's worth it. So how can we measure success and show that this test automation strategy and investment is worth it? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so I think uh, you know you're alluding towards the side of the of metrics and how we show these uh, you know uh, the value of test automation, right? So I think there's uh, over over my years of experience, there's many things I've tried. Uh, some of the stuff you know that I would say is most relevant to show these value adds and show you know the value of test automation is around you know the defects that you find, for example, like tagging those to related to automation compared to any other form that you find, you know, I think having having a clear sort of like uh, metric and way of, of uh, tagging those defects found to test automation, uh, you know, then you start looking at uh, the builds, you know, number of uh, broken builds, for example, related to test automation in your pipelines uh, could be another metric that you can pull out. Uh, test automation coverage in relation to like the full uh, test coverage you know, if you look at, you know, how much of identified test cases or scenarios you've built over the over time and how much of those are actually automated to get the percentage of that. Uh, you know, test automation duration times, like have we increased in like, you know, our test automation duration times or have we found ways to reduce that? Uh, and then, you know, just coverage across different levels, right? So I think those are mm -hmm. some of the key things that come into mind regarding, you know, how how you can show these metrics. And there's many different forms to pull those together. Some are readily available. Some you have to massage a little bit to get it in. Yeah. Yes, Cedric. I was, uh, uh, what we were saying was resonating with, with my previous kind of life and uh, where we, what, we have to convince the upper management around this. And I guess it it all so depends on the context in in the sense that for some managers, eventually, if they, they are more concerned about cost, maybe you have to show some metrics a bit more tailored around it. So I remember that, for example, uh, we pick the effort, uh, the time, the duration that we were took by executing manually test cases versus uh, doing that with test automated scripts. And like the C-level was fully in after that. <laughs> yeah. That's what we uh, needed back then in order to keep that process going mm -hmm. or ignited. Yeah. Yeah. yeah money, sales. Also. Yeah. yeah. Our, our, uh, <laughs> the, the main one. Sorry to interrupt you, Toy. I, I, it was resonating with me because when you, you try to convince oh, upper management, it will depend on the expectations they have, of course. But if you start talking about money losses or money gains, they will automatically focus your attention on you. So if you can <laughs> measure by that also, you'll be sure that that yeah. will yeah. Really work. Exactly. You're tied into some cost uh, benefit in a, in a way, right? So I think that's, uh, that's where, you know, the, it hits the pockets. And I think that's a important thing. Like if you can put it, bring it back to like the cost and, and what the benefit is for the yeah. organization and justifying that, then I think, uh, you know, it's another metric that you can clearly try to define and show. And, and we yeah. know that it's not the only one and probably not the one that we should focus our orientation at. But sometimes uh, we need to ignite this uh, somehow with the things that makes more sense for the stakeholder that needs to be convinced. Yes. It's another uh, another part of yeah, our yeah, role to translate uh, what we do and show what any of the intervenients is expecting, depending on their expectations also. So we kind of translate what we have to upper management, to product owners, to development team. 
So I think testers are good doing that. Definitely, definitely. And oh well, I, I guess we have oh, we are on time for our closing remarks, and, and time flies by at uh, Toyers. So any 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 finishing, let's say, comments or advices reg regarding this uh, test automation topic? Yeah, I think uh, regarding test automation, I think you know we've just touched a little bit on some of these points. I didn't go into too much of detail into in each one of them, but I think just based on the answers, you know, you could see how in-depth test automation could be and how many various factors to consider, right? So my sort of, you know, prescription to people out there would be, uh, you know, to, to just keep, uh, keep tabs and keep, uh, keep yourselves always involved in what's happening. Uh, you know, even if there's a new tool coming out, you know, be early adopters, try and play around, understand, you know, what it's doing, what its, what its aim is, compare it to others, you know, start thinking broader than just test automation and start thinking about the entire, you know, application architecture within, within your teams, within your organization, so that you can come up with a strategy that's more all-encompassing. I, I would say there's no one strategy that's going to fit in every company, as an example, right? You have to adopt and go on. So I think the only way you can equip yourself with that is by building the knowledge to understand what's out there to understand what options you have, and then use those in your decisions uh, to make educated decisions uh, as you move forward. Yeah? So I think that would be my advice and closing remarks around this test automation topic. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Thanks, Toyer, yeah. for being here with us. And we we now have a better understanding of, on, on a bunch of topics around test automation that can better guide us. Uh, whenever we bring test automation to, to the, the table in, in our teams. Thanks so much to both of you for having me uh, here today. Ah, it was a pleasure. So see you in our next therapy session. Happy testing. Happy testing. <laughs>